In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Tonight is, I would say, the most human night of this Holy Week experience. It's a rich night. It's a full night. We start off with that. This is the night when, and we have a litany of things uh, that we turn our attention to this night, and they all are profoundly connected to the human experience. This is the night that Jesus deeply desired to have a special meal, a Passover meal, his last meal with those that he loved in an upper room. This is the night where Jesus took off his robes and washed his disciples' feet. This is the night where he gives all of us a new commandment about how we are to take care of one another. This is also the night, the dark night of the soul, that Jesus goes out into that garden and prays. Prays like he's never prayed before. Praise that if there's any other way that this can happen, absent him drinking the cup that is set before him, please make there be another way. It's a profoundly human day. Which is fitting. Because Christ came to fully be with us. To fully incarnate the human experience. To walk with us. To show us God, by being so much like us and by understanding us. And it turns out that Jesus is pretty profound in his knowledge of how we tick, how we strange humans operate. I was struck even more by that. Uh, it seems like every other uh, Holy Week, somebody sends me something uh, by Brene Brown, and uh, I received uh, 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 a link to a, an interview uh, that she gave. She is a researcher uh, that studies the human condition, essentially. It studies what makes us tick. Uh, she's also an Episcopalian from Houston, uh, and most of her research uh, has been on belonging, the difference between fitting in and true belonging, on courage, shame, basically how we tick and what we need to be rich and full in life, what our deepest longings are. She talked about going and uh, meeting with uh, some school children, some high schoolers, uh, and they started talking about belonging, and it was starting to get very clear that this was at the core of what they sought, uh, that they were hardwired for belonging, and that they knew very clearly the difference between fitting in. And one, uh, as a series of, of people uh, presented some very, uh, very clear and articulate understandings of what it is that they sought and what it is that they were missing. Uh, one said, you know what's really difficult not fitting in or belonging at school? He says, but the hardest part is not fitting in at home, not belonging in my own household. She said, my parents were very athletic and very popular, and I just don't feel like they get me. I just feel like I don't belong in my own tribe. We are hard wired for belonging, uh, and one of the difficult tensions of that is that the easiest way to not belong is to try too hard to fit in. That the ratio between our true belonging is directly proportionate to our courage to stand alone and be who we are, to take risks. She goes on to a, a myriad of other things, but two things struck me as I reflect on this night, as I ask you to reflect on this night and what it means in your faith and in your life. Two things. One, she said, the deepest heart of belonging comes from our spiritual selves. It is in having a concrete belief that there is some force in the universe that binds all of us together. There is something larger than ourselves that binds and connects each one of us, and that, 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 that thing, that force, is benevolent, is compassionate, is loving and good. And the second, 
Because what we see in the world today, what's going on way too frequently in the world today, is people showing bravery without vulnerability. I said bravery without vulnerability is this bullying back and forth that we have. I said we've never been more separated by not necessarily even what we believe, but what we don't believe and who we don't believe in. She said that that poison is tearing us apart. But she said that she has studied and talked to Navy SEALs, talked to professional athletes, and says that there is no true act of courage absent vulnerability. So let's take those two truths. Core of our belonging is that fundamental belief that there is a power greater than ourselves that connects each one of us and that that force is good. When Jesus gathers those that he loves in that upper room when he takes that bread and that wine. When he says, this is my body that will be poured out for you. This is my blood that will be poured out for you. Do this. When you gather, gather connected together as the body of Christ, doing this because my love is spilled so fully that every time you extend your hand, you will receive that grace. I'm willing to be broken, made vulnerable, torn open so that my love may be fully known. When he took off his robe, he went and he kneeled and he washed their feet. Not only was he showing them vulnerability, but Jesus understood this was the church. And I will tell you, the worst care receivers are usually clergy. Actually, it's usually trumped by doctors. We're pretty good at serving, but we have a tough time saying, I need help. Jesus knew that about us. Jesus said to these disciples, who would be the church? Who would be the foundation of the church? You need to know what it feels like to be taken care of, to be cleaned, to be healed, to need someone to do something for you, to be in that vulnerable situation of being cared for. If you're going to go out into the world in my name and show my love, you need to know what it feels like on both sides. And to prepare you, I have this meal where you receive my brokenness, my love spilled out for you so that you can go out into the world and know that love that I've called you to share. And I have to say, I don't think this meal would mean the same thing if it weren't for that stained glass window that we walk by every time we walk from that, uh, that hallway into the church. That stained glass image of Jesus, hands in prayer on his knees in that Garden of Gethsemane. True courage, true acts of courage always involve vulnerability. I don't know that I would believe that God's love is fully poured out into that bread and that wine if we didn't have that moment where Jesus is begging, is there any other way? Is there any other way I can show them how much I love them, that I can do for them what they need and can't do for themselves? Is there any other way that I can serve them to the ultimate end short of this? And if not, I'll give everything but it'll have cost. Jesus, to the point of despair that even is near death, begging to his Father in heaven, torn open. It's in that moment that I know what gets put into my hand is pure love, because it's an act of courage met with vulnerability. So what are we called to do? called to receive that week in and week out and to serve, to be bold and courageous, but be open. Because it's with our open hearts that we can truly do acts of courage 
and follow that commandment that we're given this night. To love the way that that love was poured out for us. Amen.